Hello. Hello. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, so, I have to hold this around here. So, um, uh, welcome everyone to PLMW. I'm uh, thrilled to see all of you come here. Uh, and, uh, you know, this has been a labor of love for uh, the organizers, uh, including myself. Uh, I'm Derek Dreyer, uh, uh, Ishil Dilig, um, Ross Tate, uh, and uh, Dimitrios Vitignotis. Is he here? There he is. Um, so I want to thank all of them for working so hard on this. Um, I also, uh, so I want to make a few announcements. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the sponsors, so just to give a, a, a word of, of thanks to the sponsors. Uh, the National Science Foundation gave a lot of money, um, ACM SIGPLAN, uh, an, an anonymous donor, uh, Jane Street Capital, Facebook, uh, Cornell, Gramatech, Amazon, and Microsoft Research. Uh, this has been, uh, it's, it's been very exciting to, uh, to get so many great applications. So this year we got, um, let's get the number here, uh, we got uh, more than 160 applications uh, and it was very hard to choose uh, who to fund. So um, we, uh, they were coming from 23 different countries. Uh, we ended up funding about 62 applicants and uh, 35 which were from U.S. universities. We sort of prioritized uh, uh, U.S. applicants to some extent this year since the conference was in the U.S., but we had, uh, the rest were studying in 14 different countries, and um, uh, they think that actually included two students from St. Petersburg, Russia, which, uh, uh, which probably looked very funny on their uh, airplane tickets, but, um, <laughs> um, but uh, we were, uh, we're excited to have them here as well. Um, so, uh, a few comments about the program. So, um, so it's jam-packed with, with talks, uh, both on some on research topics and some on uh, mentoring, mentoring topics. Uh, uh, the lunch uh, is gonna be in the same room as the, uh, the lunch for the other uh, 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 events going on, but it's gonna be in a separate area of the room. And you'll be able to tell which area it's in because the tables will have um, some place cards for the mentors, which who are the, uh, basically the speakers uh, supplemented with a few other uh, uh, a few other people, uh, and so uh, you'll see those tables have uh, uh, the tables have place cards for various mentors. Um, so you'll be, have a chance to actually mingle with uh, with the speakers at the workshop. Um, the other thing is uh, dinner. So uh, there's going to be after the uh, the final uh, session, which is the young researchers, uh, the panel of, uh, of young researchers. Um, at uh, so that ends at 5:45, and then at seven o'clock, uh, the the plan is to everyone will meet in the lobby. Um, exactly where in the lobby, I'm not sure, I'll find that out, but, um, uh, but the plan is for everyone, speakers and, and uh, all of you to meet in the lobby and we'll sort of organize into groups and go out uh, for, uh, for dinner in some nearby restaurants. Okay, so, um, all right, so without further ado, I wanna start the first session by uh, introducing Matt Might. He's a professor at the, the University of Utah and he's gonna talk about um, uh, surviving grad school. All right, can everybody hear me okay? All right, well thanks, Derek. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure to be here and welcome all of you to PLMW and to Popple. Um, and I, I have the unusual pleasure these days of being a professor in both programming languages and in medicine. So I thought I would speak on a fairly universal theme for all grad students. Uh, and that theme, of course, is survival. Um, it seems no matter what field you're in, this is your dominant priority most of the time. Uh, so, uh, you know, so survival's interesting, and, and in fact, I have to compliment you on your choice of now as a particularly good time uh, to be avoiding the, the, you know, the realities of, of market forces. Um, so your survival instincts, in some sense, are already pretty good. Um, but, you know, I, I want to focus on some sort of high-level generalities about, like, what grad school is and some specific tips on how to make it go better. So what is grad school anyway? What are you here in grad school to do? Um, you know, a lot of you when, you, when you apply, and perhaps even still think this is the case, uh, that you're, you're here to learn. Uh, and I, I hate to break it to you, but that, that is not the case. Um, <laughs> you're here to do a lot of things in grad school. Uh, learning will happen, but that is an artifact of what you're really in grad school to do. And, and what you're really in, in, in grad school to do is to learn how to do science. So the question of, of what grad school is, is you know, well, what is science? What is it that you do as a scientist? Uh, and it turns out the NSF, uh, actually has a legal definition of science that they use when determining what to fund. Anybody know what the legal definition of science is? So for their purposes, it's uh, whatever PhDs do. So <laughs> it's a 
very convenient definition to defend this to, to Congress. So this shifts the question to, well, what is a PhD? Uh, and a number of years ago, I created a, a guide to describe what a PhD is, because uh, it's, it's kind of difficult to describe a PhD in words, but it's very easy to explain with pictures. So I'll go through the pictures now to explain what you're doing as a PhD student. So I want you to imagine a circle that contains all of human knowledge. Uh, when you're in grade school, you learn a little bit. When you're in secondary school, you learn a little bit more. You go to college, you get your undergrad, you gain a specialty for the first time. If you get a master's degree, you're gonna deepen that specialty. Uh, and if you, uh, you know, enroll in PhD school, then for the first half of that, you're gonna spend it walking out to the boundary of human knowledge. This is the first you know, year or so of PhD, and it's mostly comes from like reading papers and attending classes and working with your advisor. Then once you're out there at the boundary, this is when you start to focus. And, and when you, what you're doing for the next few years is you're really kind of pushing at this boundary, which you spend all of your time doing day in and day out. And after enough pushing at the boundary of human knowledge, eventually it gives way, and you've made this little dent. And that little dent is your PhD. Now, uh, just, just to give you a preview of what this is gonna be like, uh, right after your defense, the world looks a little bit different to you. You think this is the world, um, you know, your little contribution to human knowledge. But in reality, what you've done is you've made a small but meaningful contribution to the overall sum total of human knowledge. So that's lesson number one. Keep that in perspective, that you don't have to do something, you know, earth shattering. You have to do, you have to make a small but meaningful contribution to human knowledge as a grad student. That's, that's how you get out. Uh, so, you know, some of you are already in grad school, some of you are thinking about it. You know, why, why are you here? Why would you want to get a PhD in the first place? Let's go through the, the bad reasons and the good reasons. Um, well, the, one of the worst reasons to get a PhD is you just want to be called doctor. Um, turns out only your mom will call you doctor. Um, so this is, this is terrible. If you want to be called doctor, just call yourself doctor. No one checks these things, um, like Dr. Dre or Dr. Phil. Um, uh, well, or maybe you want to be a professor. So this is a much better reason to get a PhD. It's, it's certainly like, necessary to get a PhD these days if you want to be a professor. I mean, mostly necessary. There are, there are a few people that, that don't have one. Um, it's just still not a very realistic one. Because uh, if you look at the number of PhDs we produce in CS every year versus the number of tenure track jobs available for you, most people who get a PhD will not become a professor. Um, so there's really, in the end, only one good reason to get a PhD. Uh, and this is actually a reason handed down, down to me by Yanis Maridakis, who was on my committee. Uh, and he said, you know, you should get a PhD if you feel this sort of burning compulsion. And you know deep down that all along you were really supposed to be a Jedi. Um, <laughs> And if that's the case, if you just know that you, know, you want to figure out what it's like to extend the boundary of human knowledge, you're going to enjoy grad school regardless of what follows. So as long as that's your real motive, then I think grad school is for you. So what do PhD students do? You know, when I used the illustration, I said you, you push at the boundary. But what exactly is pushing anyway? That's a very abstract concept. Um, well, I, I, can, I can define it in much more concrete terms. Pushing at the boundary of human knowledge mostly consists of failing. That's what you do at the boundary. You mostly just fail. It turns out that failure is like the dominant mode of operation for academics. Um, like a good year for me is I only fail 360 days in that year. Um, and if I get five days of success, that is a fantastic year as a scientist. So uh, yeah, what, what, what is failure? Well, it turns out that like failure pervades every aspect of you know, your academic life, whether you're coming up with ideas, uh, whether you're submitting papers, whether you're trying to get an academic job, or you're trying to, as a new professor, get grants. And what I'd like to do is just briefly survey failure and what it looks like at each of these stages and then extract a unified theory of failure which you can then hack to achieve success. So in terms of generating ideas, um, you know, most of the ideas you generate actually don't work out. So I think one of the best defenses against having ideas that don't work is to have lots of ideas. And if you generate lots of ideas, eventually uh, one of them will actually be a reasonably good one. And that's the one you can take to your advisor and say, hey, I think I have a good idea. Why don't we write this up and, and submit this to uh, a conference? So you, you take that idea, you write it up, you submit it to a conference, and then it goes through a process called peer review. And what peer review is designed to do is to distill a paper down to its essence um, and give you some feedback on how to improve it for the next submission. So yeah, so it's, it's very likely the case that your very first paper will not be accepted, uh, and that's, that's okay. So you, what you do is you take these peer reviews um, and you, you integrate them into your paper to turn it into a better version of its prior self. 
uh, and then you repeat this process. You submit this one, and maybe it gets rejected too, but that's okay. You keep, you keep improving the paper, you keep submitting it, you keep submitting other papers perhaps, until eventually one of these survives peer review, and now you're a published scientist. So once you've done this roughly three times, and this sort of depends on, on where you are and what your advisor is like, roughly three really good papers to me constitutes a PhD. So you can take a stapler, uh, put these together, and now it's Dr. Yu. So you've got your PhD, and now you want to be a professor. So you take your dissertation, uh, and it's off to the academic job market you go. And suddenly you realize that you are not alone, that there are many others just like you, and they all have PhDs too. And uh, you know, I think you're roughly the odds in any given year, like you know, one to 40 or something like that, for whether or not uh, uh, you'll, you'll get an academic position. Um, I won't go into the mechanics of, of the you know, trial by combat that we use to decide who gets each slot. Uh, needless to say, at the end of this, somebody gets a job. Uh, and let's assume for the sake of this presentation that this is, this is you. So what happens next? Uh, well, it's, it's more of the same, but things are a little bit different. So you take your dissertation and you spin it into your very first grant proposal. Uh, you take this grant proposal, you send it off to Washington, D.C. or wherever your funding agency happens to be. Um, turns out, since it's you know, your life's work for the past five to seven years, they absolutely love what you've done. And, and then what they do is they dispatch what I like to call the money copter. Um, flies over your lab, and it bombs your lab with money, and you as a young scientist then transmute money directly into science. Uh, that's, that's what you do. Except obviously it's nothing like that at all. Um, what actually happens to your first grant proposal is it goes off to a panel of your esteemed peers um, who then destroy it. Um, it's like, <laughs> it's just like your first paper. There's nothing left of it by the time it gets back to you. Um, so yeah, uh, in, 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 in you'll get interesting comments on your grant proposals as well. Just like you get in your peer reviews, you'll, you'll get both, it, you know, almost certainly in every, every proposal you ever submit, whether it's accepted or not, that it both needs more preliminary work and yet it seems that all the work is already done. Um, sometimes even within the same reviewer's review. Uh, so bonus points if you get both. So the process is really the same. You, you just keep submitting grant proposals, making them better and better and better uh, as, as you integrate the feedback from reviews. And eventually, one of your proposals gets accepted too. Uh, and then what they do is they, they use this accounting technique called dividing your budget by three, uh, and the money rolls in. So now you have money to fund grad students, and now you can do science. Uh, and so what you can see here is that you know, there, there's a lot of failure going on at every stage in your academic life. Uh, but in some sense, it was the same game every single time. So if you, look, if you think about it, what you're doing is, is you're tossing weighted coins. And you're just hoping that one of them will eventually come up heads. So we can describe this. We can describe this, this process of failure, and we can do something about it. So what, what's, what's the theory here? Well, you've got some probability P that any individual thing you attempt will fail. Uh, and so if, if P is the probability of an individual failure, you can, ex you can extract from this the probability that you'll, uh, you'll fail n times in a row. So if you try something n times, the probability that you're going to fail all n times is p to the n, which means the probability that you succeed at least once is 1 minus p to the n. And the interesting thing about you know, this, this equation for success is that it has, it has a very specific shape. So what you'll find is that you very rapidly approach success in the number of, of attempts. So the, you know, the more you try, the exponentially closer you get to success. And this is, this is a key thing to understand. So for example, just to, just to make this very concrete, let's suppose that your individual probability of failure for, say, submitting a paper is 85%. Um, but you submit 10 papers. Your aggregate probability of success is then 80%. So you can start off with a very high probability of failure and turn that through effort into a very high likelihood of success. Um, and the other thing you have to remember here is that you know, your probability of, of failure, or in some sense your, the quality of your work, uh, and the, the amount of work you're doing, they're not independent of one another. They're actually related. You know, so your, your probability of success or failure is actually related to how much you are trying to do at any one point in time. And so this leads to an optimization problem when you consider the shape of this curve. So if you're doing a few things, and you're really focusing on those few things, you can make them much higher quality, and you have, you have a better chance of success. If you're trying to do too much, then your probability of failure goes way up because you're just not putting the time necessary into uh, the, the work you're doing. So somewhere in there, is the optimum amount of, of work to do to, to get the right amount of quality out so that you, you, you maximize the amount of, of papers you get published or whatever metric you want. So this is essentially the game you're playing as a grad student, trying to find out 
where that balance and the tension is between uh, the amount of, work, amount of things you're working on and the quality that you're getting out as a result. Uh, and in, I mean, you, you continue to play this game for the rest of your life as an academic, um, and it changes over time depending on, on what you're trying to do. But this is, this is fundamentally what you're trying to do, is figure out how to carve up your time to do the best work that you can. Um, so now, now I want to get a little more specific about uh, ways to succeed in grad school. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll start off by talking about the common modes of failure uh, that you see in grad school. And not, not the good kind of failure, I mean like fail out of grad school failure. Uh, so ordinarily I think failure is a, is a good thing if, you're, if it comes from trying to do things like submit papers or have good ideas. Um, but there are ways to just fail that have absolutely no positive benefits for you. So the first one of those is to focus on grades. And this, is, this requires sort of a, a, you know, a shift in mentality when you come up from, from undergrad because their grades actually mattered. And as a PhD student, no one cares about your grades. If, if somebody actually asks about your GPA in grad school, they have no idea what grad school is, is all about. So I've come up with a, a handy formula for my graduate students to calculate the optimum GPA to have during grad school. And it, it's, it's very simple. You take your, your department manual for grad students, extract the minimum GPA, and you add epsilon to that. Um, that's the optimum GPA. Because if you get anything higher than that, what that means is that you were wasting time on classes that could have been spent on science. So keep that in mind. Uh, and I'm always proud of my students that actually really take this part of it to heart. And some of, <laughs> some of them actually do. <laughs> uh, the other thing you can do is you could learn too much. You know, it's, it's really, I mean, it's, it's so easy to just keep reading paper after paper after paper and forget to write one. Um, you know, it's, I think it's, it's safe to say that if you, go to, if you go to get a PhD, you love knowledge. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Loving knowledge is a wonderful thing. Um, but you can, you can fall too in love with knowledge and forget to actually create some. So keep that in mind as well. Um, another particularly pernicious way that grad students uh, flame out is to expect perfection. You know, it's generally the case that a lot of us, when we, when we were undergrads, you know, we, we like to do well. And, and, it's, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with doing well. But perfectionism uh, can, can be particularly fatal in, in grad school. And, and here's why. So if, you know, if you're trying to achieve perfection, you're never going to get there. Perfection is this state that you approach asymptotically over time as you put increasing amounts of effort in. Uh, and so if you actually expect to hit perfection on any individual item, you will never actually submit anything. And there are examples of, of scientists out there that uh, because of their perfectionism, it actually hindered their career. I think uh, Cavendish is one of them who independently discovered about five different laws in, in chemistry and physics decades before anybody else discovered them, um, but refused to publish them because he was worried about the, you know, the, the, the format of his manuscripts. Um, so at some point, you've just got to say, you know what, this, this, this is good enough to submit, and I'm going to let it out there into the world. Um, and uh, you know, once you've hit good enough, you know, that's, that's the point where you stop and say, let's just, let's just go with this. And just, just to give you another little story, um, I, I like to think of the master of good enough in, in science in general as none other than Einstein himself. So I'll tell you a story. Does anybody know what Einstein got his PhD on? Like I've, I've given this talk to physicists and chemists, and they don't know either. Um, no one remembers Einstein's PhD, and there's a really good reason no one remembers his PhD. So Einstein got his PhD in a principled calculation of Avogadro's number from kin molecular kinematics. Um, and the incredible thing about Einstein's PhD is that it's wrong. It's like, <laughs> it is off by a factor of three. This is like blow up the rocket ship wrong. Um, and so his committee pointed this out, like, dude, you, this number, like, we can measure it. You know you're wrong, right? He's like, yeah, I know I'm wrong. Doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> and by the way, call me Dr. Einstein. <laughs> Um, but it, it gets better from there because, okay, now he's got his PhD. He's like, okay, so my PhD, that sucked. Um, he get, so he, he makes another principled calculation, and now he's, he's still wrong, but now only by a factor of two. This is still like blow up the rocket ship wrong. Um, but he publishes that too. And they're like, you're still wrong. Like, what are you, what are you doing? Uh, and he's like, wait, wait, one more try, one more try. So he publishes that, he gets it right. So. You know, there's, there's a, people, people talk about Einstein as being a genius, and it's absolutely true, but the reason we as scientists respect him is that he's the only one of us to ever turn one mistake into three publications. Um, so I, I challenge all of you to do the same. Uh, to obviously procrastination, major killer in grad school. Um, uh, you know, grad school in some sense is an act of procrastination in and of itself. You're just avoiding the real world. Um, so it's, it's a strong tendency in all of us. And I think if you, if you know yourself to be a procrastinator, and you know you are, 
um, then you need to be honest with yourself and take measures to defend against that. And I'll, I'll talk about a few specific ones later. You can also go rogue too early or late uh, in the advising process. And by this, I mean the point at which you start to disobey your advisor's direct orders and set the research agenda yourself. I mean, at some point, you will know more than your advisor. And the tricky part in all this is that you will know that moment has arrived before your advisor does. Uh, and so at some point, it's sort of incumbent upon you to, to take the reins of your research and charge ahead. But if you mistime that moment, uh, in either direction, really, it, it leads to a little bit of friction. You can also end up in trouble if you try to treat your grad school experience like it's just a regular job. It's, this is not a nine to five experience. Uh, it's not, in, despite the fact that we call it grad school, it's not really school either. The closest description of what grad school is actually like is it's more like a monastic experience. Um, and I mean, it comes complete with a vow of poverty and a clerical hood at the end. So really, this, this is not your typical job. Uh, you really need to sort of focus on this day in, day out. Um, because if, and, and, and the reason you can do that is because you should be intensely interested in what it is you're doing. And if you're not intensely interested in what you're doing, then why are you in grad school? Uh, so this, you need to sort of live and breathe your, your research as a grad student. And you're, you're not going to get an opportunity to do something like that ever again. It doesn't happen like that when, when you're a professor. So folk, you take that opportunity now and go all the way. Uh, you could ignore your committee, because uh, I guarantee you your committee will not ignore you. Uh, if they give you some advice at, at your proposal, Take that advice, because otherwise it will come back to haunt you at your defense. Uh, you can aim too low. So you can say, well, that idiot got a PhD in our department. I'll do no, no better than he did. Um, and the problem with that is that you know, there's, there's an inherently probabilistic process. And if you sort of aim for the, the, the lower bar, there's a chance you're going to miss it. Conversely, you can aim too high. You know, remember, a PhD is a small but meaningful contribution to human knowledge. And, it's, and you can actually overdo it. Uh, so once, once you've hit the, the threshold of small but meaningful, you are done, and you can go on to be a postdoc, a professor somewhere else, and do more research there. Uh, or you can miss the real milestones. So like PhD programs have all these ridiculous milestones, like qualifiers and coursework and proposals and dissertations. But what you're really in grad school to do is to learn how, under the mentorship of your advisor, do peer-reviewable science. Uh, that's what you're really here to do. So if you focus on the, the, the product, which is communicating science to the public through, through publications, you're going to do fine. Uh, so now I'll sort of end with a long list of tips, tricks, and hacks that you can use uh, to improve your, your grad student life. And all this really comes down to hacking failure and really hacking the, the equation for failure. And, and this really comes down to either doing things better uh, or doing more things. So how can we do each of these things for, for the various categories I talked about earlier? So for, in terms of ideas, um, if you want more ideas, there's, there's a lot of things you can do. But I think the simplest thing you can do right off the bat is to simply collect the ideas you're already having. Chances are you're missing a lot of good ideas because you don't write them down. So there's a simple remedy here. You just put notepads everywhere, by your desk, by your bed, uh, and even if you have to in the shower. Uh, in fact, this is like the best place to put a notepad. They actually make waterproof notepads for the shower. And you'll be shocked after you start doing this for a while just how many good ideas you were just flushing straight down the drain. Um, because yeah, it's like you have all these great ideas, then you step out, and it's like, ah, where'd that idea go? It's gone. You don't even remember you had it. So do, so do this for sure. But what if you want better ideas? Um, yeah. What if you want better ideas? Uh, I, I think here what you really should do is embrace the uncomfortable. And by this I mean, do stuff that it makes you look like, like, suppose you don't like to dance. Go learn how to dance. Or if you're uncomfortable with public speaking, go, go do a lot of public speaking. Or switch from QWERTY to Dvorak. Or you know, try a different dietary restriction. Just do something that's outside the norm that makes you a little bit uncomfortable. Because I think this is how you sort of unlock creativity um, by, by you know, exposing yourself to things that you wouldn't normally do. Uh, and on that vein, you can also engage other fields. Uh, it's, if, if you're sort of short on ideas, take two fields and smush them together. Uh, and it's, it's generally the case that you're going to find ideas at the intersection of fields no matter what. So if it's you know, programming languages and pharmacology, or programming languages and linguistics, you're going to find ways to, to find something new at the intersection of fields. Uh, I, think, I think it's also important to exercise and stay healthy. Um, so there's this abstraction of grad students frequently used by advisors, which is that your brain connected to a laptop that generates LaTeX. Um, <laughs> and, and that's actually not the case at all. You have a body attached to that brain connected to the keyboard. And so don't use this model for yourself as well. Remember that you know, you're, you're, you're Body's connected to the brain. The brain, if the body's healthy, the brain is healthy too. You get a better mind. So do actually spend some time uh, exercising and eating healthy. I think it's a very, it's, it's, it's way too easy to forget this in grad school. All right, so that's, that's ideas. How about papers? How do you get, get better at papers? Well, if you want more papers, uh, you really want to sort of maximize the rate at which you can write them. And to do that, uh, you need to practice writing a lot. So write a lot. 
And I recommend writing every day. There's lots of opportunities to do this now. Uh, you can have a blog. You can, you can do tweets. And honestly, if you can't come up with you know, 140 characters of syntactically correct thought every day, maybe, maybe grad school is not for you. Um, so at least tweet. Uh, I think it's important to eliminate distraction. Uh, and to do this, you in many ways have to cripple your technology. So uh, there's a lot of stuff out there that can help you avoid distraction through technology. You, there's these browser extensions like LeechBlock for Firefox and Waste No Time for Safari and Stay Focused for Chrome that will let you block out the sites that uh, you don't want to visit because they're just chewing up your time. Uh, I don't think there is one for Internet Explorer, but honestly, if you're using Internet Explorer, why are you here? Uh, <laughs> um, the other thing you can do is you can do social pressure. You can turn your monitor around so that your, your lab mates can actually see what you're doing. Um, and maybe you'll feel shamed into actually doing research as a result. Actually, it works. This actually works. I tried this out when I was a grad student. Uh, there's even more severe programs like Freedom. You pay $10 for this. It's like the greatest program ever. And what it does is it breaks your laptop. Um, it completely disables the networking, so you can't get online to do anything. Um, and now there's a free one, too, called Self Control, which is almost as good. Uh, you can use techniques like uh, the, the Pomodoro technique, where you set a little kitchen timer for 25 minutes and have these, these you know, bursts of productivity. Uh, assuming you can get 25 minutes distraction free regularly throughout the day. I don't recommend this if you have small children. Um, you can pick up on productivity techniques like getting things done. I highly recommend you, you get into this, this habit now because it's, you know, grad school is a great time to start practicing productivity. It gets a lot harder once you're a professor. Uh, in terms of better papers, um, you have to realize that most papers are true, um, but most papers get rejected. And you know, that's you know, this, this is just sort of a fact of life. And at first, this leads you to believe things like, well, maybe my peers just can't handle my brand of truth. Uh, maybe that's the problem. Uh, except that the, the reality is that in academia, the truth has never been enough. It's, it, the truth is not sufficient to get a publication. Um, so your model of grad school, uh, when, you, when you start out, might not actually fit what happens once you're out there in the real, real world. Because uh, the real metric is you have to have something that is true, novel, and interesting. Interesting is the thing that's really hard to hit. So you need to practice persuading people, both in oral communication and in written communication. There's a fantastic book out there for doing this. It's called Influence, and virtually every MBA student has to read it. I think every PhD student should have to read it too. So I highly recommend you go check out this book. It's on sort of like the science of persuasion. And you know, practice things like disagreeing with yourself uh, so that you can eventually learn to see things from the reviewer's point of view. You want to practice communicating um, because you commu you know, the better you are at communicating, the more bandwidth you get when you go from brain to brain. You know, we, can't, we can't go brain to brain directly. We go through this process of written communication. So the better you get at that, the, uh, um, the easier it gets to go uh, to transmit thoughts from one person to another. And uh, you know, if, if, you, if you're a bad communicator or if you don't have a lot of practice at it, then it's, it's like you know, pushing knowledge through a tiny little straw. It doesn't work out so well. So you can volunteer to speak. Um, if you're not very comfortable with public speaking, then I recommend this book, Even a Geek Can Speak. It's a fantastic sort of one afternoon uh, you know, uh, advice manual on how to, how to speak. Um, and in terms of get, you know, getting more jobs out there on the academic job market, this is tough. Um, and you can't really create more jobs unless you can get an act of Congress passed uh, to increase science funding. That's hard. So you really need to have a backup. And this means like a postdoc or a startup so that you can hang out and capture more of the, the window when jobs are available. In terms of boosting your odds, you're actually doing the right thing right now. You can connect with people. Uh, and if you don't know how to like, talk to somebody at a conference, just go up and say, hey, I really like your work on X. We all like to talk about our work on X. So, uh, that works. Or you can say, hey, I, just, I enjoyed your talk. And people like to hear how they, how they spoke, so that, that works. Uh, so it's very easy to engage people if you use those two, those two lines right there. Again, you can blog and tweet to get yourself your message out amongst your peers. And then uh, to conclude, you know, the, the generic advice you always get, particularly as like a, a pre-tenure professor, is you should do high-impact work. You should publish high-impact papers and give high-impact talks. Like, what the heck is impact? I have no idea what that means. Well, actually, I, I have a sense of it, what it is now. And impact is really... This, this product of style and substance. And there's a lot of emphasis on substance as a grad student, you know, the, the, the meat of the work. But style actually matters quite a bit. How you communicate your work does make a difference. So uh, my last piece of advice is to really develop your own sense of style as a grad student. Other people will recognize in your work, um, uh, both, both in writing and when you, and when you present. Uh, so with that, if we have any time, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. We're all set. <laughs> yep. Do I use it? I, I, I used to, but now I have three small children. It's almost impossible. 
It's good on airplanes, though. Like, airplanes, I can actually get away with it, but not in my regular day. Yep. Okay, awesome.